Two things today, we call it the biome cycle, but what is it? They call it the ugly stage, but what is that? This is Beers TV Investigates, and the answers are going to shape this experiment and reshape how you look at your tank. A coral reef biome, a vast community of organisms that live inside and around the coral, all thriving in a shared environment of temperature, light intensity, and nutrient levels. We commonly think of this as a harmonious ecosystem of fish, coral, snails, urchin, and shrimp, because it's what we can see with the naked eye. However, beyond what the eye can see is a marine microbiome, similar but on a much smaller scale. Thousands of types of bacteria, microscopic life forms that scour the surfaces looking for resources and territory. A reef tank's an attempt to take a slice of that ocean biome and recreate it in a much smaller form factor in our living rooms, ideally in a manner that looks visibly powerful. While we can't see the microbiome more with the naked eye, we can see when it's going wrong. It's called the ugly stage, where the green and brown algae take hold, rapidly spreading, cyano emerges, diatom blooms, and dinos collect into a slime that blankets the tank. The biome cycle experiment is a deliberate attempt to create a natural, stable biome from the start and avoid the most challenging aspects of a new reef tank. In this series, you're going to see a few themes emerge. One, these ugly photosynthetic pests all have different, ideal environments where they thrive. Two, solving for one often creates an ideal environment for the next in a frustrating game of whack the ugly. Third, rather than focusing on one of those individual lessons, we consider how these lessons layer together to create a network of biome redundancy where one layer supports the next and solves the next wave before it ever happens. First step, know your enemy. There are five major uglies, chrysophytes or golden brown algae, cyanobacteria, diatoms, dinoflagellates, and green algae. You'll see all 12 of these in our experimental tanks, all thriving in different environments. Starting with chrysophytes, often referred to as golden brown algae because of the color, but there are over thousands of types that range from looking like golden brown fuzz, a light brown filamentous algae, or even colonies that develop into bubble-like forms. Many types looking like a hybrid bridge between algae and bacterial pests. Chrysophytes are mobile and can easily migrate throughout the entire tank. Because of that, you can often see chrysophytes suddenly emerge and cover the entire tank all at once. While well, chrysophytes thrive in light in the absence of ideal environments like minimal light, some forms of chrysophytes may turn predator, feeding on bacteria or diatoms rather than light, meaning the dark period may not eradicate chrysophytes quickly. In our experiments, there seems to be an inverse relationship between many forms of chrysophyte and basically every other pest. When one shows up, the other leaves. It's rare to see many forms of chrysophytes share the tank with anything else. We'll explore why that is throughout this experiment. I personally only encountered chrysophytes in newly established dry rock tanks, likely because chrysophytes are better prepared to take advantage of an imbalanced environment or biome. In our experiments, they showed up in what most reefers would consider to be the most sterile approaches to cycling a tank. Chrysophytes also seem to outcompete other photosynthetic uglies in the lowest nitrate and phosphate environments, potentially because they can scavenge sources of nitrogen and phosphorus better or faster than other organisms. In this case, they may be able to acquire nutrients via preying on bacteria or diatoms, that microscopic war that we can't see. Nutrients is one of the important themes to look for in this experiment. Why are high or low nitrate and phosphate levels both the cause and the solution depending on the type of pest you're dealing with? The answer in just a moment when we weave together those layers of biome redundancy. Next, cyanobacteria, one of the causes of red, reddish brown, or purple slime that covers surfaces. Under the microscope, it looks like a network of thin strands that can crowd everything else out. Cyano prefers low flow areas of the tank. When removed, often comes back exactly where it was rather than spread to another area. Cyano may prefer low flow areas simply because it doesn't get blown away as easily, but low flow areas also happen to be where all the decaying organics, nitrogen and phosphorus settle out as well. Cyano is a component of the ugly stage in new tanks just as often as in more established tanks. It's commonly believed that cyano is directly caused by high nutrients and poor tank maintenance, which is likely only partially true. I've never once seen anyone solve it by lowering nitrate and phosphate, even for prolonged periods of time. There's a relationship with nitrate and phosphate, but likely not as simple as high or low levels or the direct cause or a preventative. One thing we see consistently in this experiment is small amounts of cyano eventually shows itself in most tanks, but only becomes a major problem when the tank has a lot of decaying organics settling out and inadequate methods of rapidly removing those organics from the tank. We commonly see cyano explosion right after a different pest organism dies off. One problem, the direct cause of the next. 
Maybe the biggest tell that you're dealing with cyano is red slime remover and ChemiClean work at nearly eliminating it from the tank. Red Slime Remover says that it's a salt-based biological accelerator, which may affect cyano's biology directly or may simply feed competitive organisms that then outcompetes the cyano for nutrients or territory, likely another healthy bacteria or component of biofilm that beats out the cyano. ChemiClean also says it's a proprietary salt, but in this case says it works by oxidizing trapped organic sludge and then promotes ideal enzyme balance visually different salt-based solutions, but both work well in seemingly different ways. These effective solutions providing a window into preventions as well. Can a healthy bacterial biofilm in the rock or sand help outcompete cyano? Can a solution for excess decaying organics like flow, filtration, oxidizers like ozone, scavengers or predators prevent the cyano before it takes over? Next, diatoms, a single-celled algae that exists in tens to hundreds of thousands of species on Earth in a reef tank often experienced as a light to medium brown coating in new tanks that disappears as fast as they come, a cycle that can last as little as a week. Other times, diatoms can come back with a vengeance and cover the entire tank. When diatoms get this invasive, they tend to outcompete nearly everything and swallow the tank. They're dependent on nitrogen, phosphorus, and light for energy, reproducing rapidly and potentially outcompeting slower growing organisms for nutrients. Nutrient control does not seem to be an effective method of preventing or eliminating explosive waves of diatoms. Because their cell walls are made of silica, essentially glass shells, some reefers have attempted to limit silica. While silica may be a contributing factor or partial solution, it doesn't seem to prevent or solve diatoms on its own. There's one unique difference here. A lot of organisms eat diatoms and most of us are probably totally unaware because you can't see it with the naked eye. We already shared that some forms of chrysophytes eat diatoms, but microcrustaceans do as well. For instance, algae barns share that diatoms are an important part of raising copepods. Without the diatoms, the cultures fail over time. The Monterey Bay Aquarium's website states that a single copepod may eat as much as 11,000 to 370,000 diatoms in a 24-hour period. And that's just one copepod. So beating or preventing diatoms may be less about starving them of nutrients and more about a balanced, redundant biome where all of these organisms live harmoniously. Then there's the dreaded dinoflagellates. This can look like a lot of things, but most commonly snotty, bubbly slime in the tank that replaces itself as fast as it's removed. There are thousands of species in saltwater, many are super hard to beat, and the solution for one species does not work for another. Reefers typically beat them with a few solutions, mostly centered around not eliminating dinos, but promoting what competes with dinos for resources. Dosing bacteria in a bottle like Microbacter 7, adding rock from an established tank, a dark period to set the dinos back, and making sure that there's actually detectable nitrate and phosphate for the microscopic unseen competitors to grow and replicate. A UV sterilizer or UV poisoning, the free swimming types, is a very effective near instant solution for many types of dinos as well. The reality is dinos, diatoms, and cyanoslimes are likely identified incorrectly more often than not. However, the future might be less about correctly identifying them and more about avoiding them altogether. Redundant layers of protection for all three within a healthy, balanced biome. The best example of biome redundancy is with our fifth photosynthetically ugly, the green algae, hair, turf, bubble, bryopsis, and film algae. Rather than treat algae explosions with pounds of cure, what are the five ounces of prevention? Ounce number one, preventing green algae starts with limiting the introduction to the tank in the first place, often best done with the use of dry rock, which won't have green algae, or dark cured live rock, which will have killed most of it off, removing coral plugs, which have a lot of photosynthetics on them, and peroxide dipping coral bases that tolerate it. It will dramatically reduce the types of green algae introduced to the tank. In this experiment, you will see the effect of doing this well and poorly. Ounce of prevention number two, a healthy biofilm on the rock. Biofilm, meaning a healthy protective bacterial population, has been established. It's inevitable that some algae will make its way into the tank via coral, snail, crab, and even fish additions, particularly in LPS tanks, which have large, hard-to-clean skeletal structures and surface for the algae to settle out on. But also droplets of water from the bag, and potentially foods, and even fish feces may introduce forms of green algae to the tank. So for what does make it in the tank, we rely on that unseen, critical second layer defense. A healthy biofilm or even competitive desirable algae like coralline prevents the uglies from rapidly spreading or settling out in new areas of the tank. 
which of course is what this series is all about. For the first time, we track how well that unseen layer of biome works visually, but also with DNA testing from aquabiomics. There is a connection. Ounce three micro predators for the green algae that does have a chance to settle. There's another nearly unseen and likely underappreciated third layer defense, micro crustaceans, copepods, amphipods, micro snails, and other tiny little crustaceans. These predatory organisms that spend their entire life cycle scouring surfaces and hunting down the soft beginnings of algae before you can see it. Some methods of establishing these populations more effective than others. It's likely common pods and micro crustaceans will find their way into every tank eventually. So biome cycling for this may be more about the timing of introduction in relation to the ugly stage than it is about eventualities. Ounce of prevention for meso predators for what makes it past those micro crustaceans. We have our snails, crabs, limpets, shrimps, urchins, all spreading their entire life cycle scouring the surface of rock and sand for algae and slimes to eat. In this case, we actually see them doing their work. Some urchins eating what others won't. However, it's often easier to see what it looks like when they're not doing their work. Ounce five of prevention macro predators or utilitarian fish. The most obvious layer of defense for green algae because they hunt it down all day. The best approach is a mix of mouth shapes, teeth, and taste, like yellow or purple tangs, which graze all day on filamentous algae, bristletooth tangs, like whitetail, coal, or tamini, which have mouths designed to scrape the rock for different forms of algae and slimes, as well as some reef safe with caution fish, like fox face rabbits and angelfish, which will graze on algae all day as well. Fox face rabbit fish sometimes having a taste for bubble algae that others won't. The big takeaway here is a lot of people consider these types of utilitarian fish and cleanup crews as the primary solution, but in reality, they're one of the last lines of defenses. Essentially, the fish are a very effective band-aid for when the rest of the biome is not in ecological balance. Those five ounces of prevention, avoiding introduction, healthy biofilm, micro, meso, and macro predators, this is the foundation of what we're going to call biome redundancy, a network of protection that lets almost nothing through. Notice nutrients and starving the algae is not the primary frontline solution either. I believe the goal here should be low, but measurable nutrients that are not perpetually rising week after week. That's because the hammer solutions of more or less nitrate and phosphate can cause as many issues and imbalances in the tanks as they solve. Also notice that environmental poisons like oxidants, UV, algicides, and similar hammer solutions are not the primary frontline either. These are the treatments for when everything else has gone wrong use them when needed, but the goal of the biome cycle is to reduce the need to begin with. How do we do that? It starts with a theory, an experiment that proves it. That's next, the 12 experiment tanks.